Hello everyone and welcome back to the JMZ Online YouTube channel. Today's video is going to cover the machining and rebuilding process of this three-cylinder Perkins diesel out of a Massey Ferguson industrial tractor. Don't forget to check out the first video in this two-part series where we showed the teardown process of this engine which revealed some broken piston rings and overall just a tired engine that was ready for some freshening up. The first step of any process in our shop is the cleaning of the engine components and in this case the engine block was washed in our industrial spray cabinet while many of the other parts were baked and blasted. Thorough cleaning keeps our shop clean as well as makes it easier to inspect components for damage. And jumping forward right into the rebuild, we've got the engine block mounted on our engine stand and we're getting the main bearings set in place. As I was doing this, I found that a spider had made himself at home in one of the main bolt holes, so rather than crush him, I decided to suck him up in the vacuum. Lucky for the customer, the crankshaft was in pretty well perfect condition, so rather than having to grind the journals and order undersized bearings, we were able to save some money by polishing the crank and sticking with standard size rod and main bearings. We can't forget about installing the thrust washers, and it's always important to make sure that everything is lubed up well with assembly lube as we're going together. As I'm installing the main caps, you'll see that I'm making sure they are seated well against the block before tightening them down to avoid damaging the locating dowels, which we had to replace a couple due to the last assembler not being as careful. With the lower thrust washers in and all of the main caps installed, we run them down snug before bumping the crank back and forth to help align the thrust surfaces. Although this block has dowels that align the caps, it's something that we do out of habit. Here we're double checking the end plate just to make sure that everything's within spec. Finally, we're moving on to getting the pistons installed on the connecting rods, which brings us to the first piece of the puzzle that we actually did some machine work on. The big ends of the rods were in good condition, but the wrist pin bushings needed replaced. This pin boring machine can be adjusted for the correct center to center length of the connecting rod, and Dad always likes to check his setup by pretend boring the rod with the old bushings still in as a way to double check the length setting is correct. The old bushings press right out, and the new bushings are pressed into place with a bit of green Loctite before going back on the pin boring machine, and they're made with plenty of extra meat to them so that they can be rough bored at the correct center to center length. While it could be possible to bore them to exactly the right dimension on one machine, it's really best to bring them close to the finished size and then finish the bushing by honing it on the sun and hone to the exact recommended pin clearance. Right there I should be at minimum clearance. The precision bore gauge allows us to measure the exact clearance, but it also comes down to a bit of a feel as well. We also installed new connecting rod bolts, but did not see the need to resize the big end as they were in very good condition. With everything lubed up, it's important to get the piston mounted on the connecting rod in the correct orientation, and with floating pins like this, it's important to make sure that um, the clips are installed correctly so that nothing comes loose during engine operation. Here we have a brand new set of standard size pistons and rings that are going into this engine, so we're installing the oil control ring, the lower two compression rings, and the upper compression ring, which is a different material. It's actually chrome paste. So we're gonna go ahead and give the cylinder walls a good coating of assembly lubricant and start getting the pistons dropped in. But I'm assuming some of you are wondering if we actually did any machine work on the engine block itself, considering the damage we saw to the cylinders during the teardown. The answer is obviously yes. Rather than boring for oversized pistons, these engines have replaceable liners that bring you back to standard size. So you have to remove the old liners in order to get the new ones pressed into place. Our preferred method of removal is to use our boring machine to bore the liner within around 15 thousandths of the block's parent bore, which leaves them thin enough for easy removal. This does require centering up accurately on each cylinder, which really isn't too tough on our machine, which has a centering indicator, and by moving the table of the machine in the X and Y axes, we can get the indicator to show that we are centered sufficiently accurately before locking down the table and making our machining operation. With the cutter set to the correct dimension, it's as simple as getting the cutter installed into the spindle and firing up the machine to make the cut. These sleeves are flanged, meaning the top of the block has a counterbore where a larger diameter step of the sleeve sets against at the top. Before letting the cutter run all the way through, it never hurts to stop the machine just below this flange and make sure that we aren't cutting into the parent bore of the block. At this point it looks like everything's set correctly, so I went ahead and broke off that upper flange and proceeded with boring on through the rest of the sleeve. And yes, I have seen the comments in the past saying to use a sleeve puller or even run a bead of weld down the sleeve and it'll fall right out. That may be the case, but in our shop we've seen too many blocks damaged by people attempting those techniques and failing. So this works well for us. If you have a different technique that you like, go ahead and do it to each their own. With the sleeves board paper thin, we can take something stiff and thin, in this case a pocket knife, and break the remaining sleeve out of the block. 
Sometimes you can get it to simply break out in one piece, but I ended up with the sleeve still a little bit thick here, so it didn't come out quite as easily. Upon inspecting the parent bores of the block, everything looked to be in adequate condition. Unlike a Farmall that I have a video from roughly a year ago where we found the parent bore to be in terrible condition, so that was good. That being said, the counter bores and the bores themselves were pretty dirty, so I did lightly wire wheel the counter bores and then ran the block through the spray cabinet quickly to get them clean and ready for the new sleeves. Before installing the sleeves, I made the decision to deck the block and make sure that the deck surface would clean without excessive surfacing. If excessive surfacing was required, it would mean that we needed to recut the counter bores deeper so that the flange sleeves didn't stick up too high. But the surface cleaned in just under two thousandths, which wasn't excessive enough to warrant recutting the counter bores. The sleeves do have pretty thin walls, so there is a chance of damaging them pretty easily if you aren't careful with getting them pressed into the block. They don't have a lot of press fit, but it was enough that I preferred to get them started by hand before moving over into the shop press to get them pressed the rest of the way down. We do have an awesome air and manual bottle jack set up on this press that BVA Hydraulics was kind enough to send us to replace the old Harbor Freight bottle jack that we had and it handles these sleeves and installs super well. As you can see, it makes quick easy work of running the sleeve down close using the air actuation, but if you want, you can still use the manual pump, which gives a more tactile feel so that you can more easily tell when you're bottoming the sleeve against the counter board. With the sleeves pressed into place, they did protrude above the deck about two thousandths, which is technically within spec according to the specifications we had, but we decided that we would prefer to have them exactly flush with the deck surface so we ran the surfacer across one more time, which brought the total amount surfaced off of the deck to three thousandths from where it was originally. These liners are technically finished as ordered, meaning they are meant to be installed into the block with no additional machine work required. We prefer to use rough liners and finish them ourselves, but this was all that was available at the time. That being said, we do prefer to go ahead and do a bit of finish work on them in our cylinder hone, as you will often find that there are tight spots present in the sleeve which should really be straightened out for this engine to run at its best when it's done with no issues. With just a little bit of finesse, we can take care of getting the cylinders straighter and as close to perfect as possible without having to take a ton of material out, which would create excessive clearance. Would it run without this step? Probably so, but why not make it as good as it can possibly be when it leaves our shop? At that point, we've completed all of the machine work necessary on the block itself to get it ready for reassembly, so the block gets one last wash in the spray cabinet to take care of any grime that may be left from the machining process before it can be reassembled. And with that, we can jump back to where we were as we were getting the piston assemblies installed in the block. A good ring compressor is always a key to getting the assemblies into the cylinders without any damage, and bolt boots should always be used on the rod bolts to prevent dinging the crank as the rod comes against the crankshaft. The new rod bearings have assembly lubricant on them as well, and we always like to ensure that the rod caps are well seated against the rod before going ahead and tightening and torquing the rod nuts. Once all of the pistons are in and the rod bolts have been torqued to spec, we're going to roll the engine around so that we can go ahead and measure the piston height relative to the deck surface of the block to make sure that we're within the specified limits of protrusion or recession. Everything checks out, so the next thing that we're working on installing is the oil pump, which we did previously take apart to inspect the components before going back together with this engine. We also did a visual inspection on all of the gears as well as check the backlash to verify that we were within reasonable limits um, as opposed to spending the money to replace items that don't necessarily need replaced. We did have a new rear main seal to install in the seal housing, which was done using one of our hydraulic presses. And this is another instance where it's important to be careful to get everything aligned correctly. And we use lacquer thinner as a lubricant to press the seal into place, which consequently dries afterwards. With gaskets like these, we always like to use a light coating of silicone on both sides. And she's gonna kill me for this, but I'm pretty sure that was the fiance's cue that it was time to head home for the day. Nevertheless, I kept on working and got the seal installed, being sure to have the seal lubricated well before getting the housing installed and all of the bolts torqued. I don't know why I did so much back and forth, but next I jumped over to the front side of the engine and started working on getting the gasket installed for the timing gear housing. The aluminum housing kind of locates on that idler gear shaft and it has about a million different bolts that have to be installed to hold it in place. And it's important to note that these bolts used here are special short headed bolts so that the gears that will be installed later do not rub against the heads of the bolts. 
I'm not sure what to call this piece here, but the faces of it need to be coated with a light layer of silicone so that it doesn't leak, and it needs aligned to the front edge of the timing gear case well using a straight edge so that the cover will seal correctly later on. Next, I jumped back to the back side of the engine to get the transmission adapter plate installed to the block. This massive piece of cast iron doesn't really need to be sealed that I know of, but the last guy installed it with a layer of silicone, as did I. I suppose it's possible that the water could somehow leak in otherwise, but they don't make a gasket in the gasket set for it. When it comes to gaskets like the oil pan gasket shown here, it's not uncommon to find that they don't actually fit quite perfectly out of the box, so you shouldn't be afraid of doing a slight bit of trimming to get the fit that you really desire. We also recommend using a light bit of silicone sealer at the mating points of the cork gasket and the paper type material gaskets just as an extra layer of comfort. Went ahead and lubed up the gears on the oil pump before we covered it up and I knew there was no way I could handle the massive cast iron oil pan on my own so I recruited my dad's help. And before tightening all of the bolts down and torquing them we did pull it tight against that trans adapter plate um, using a couple of clamps. Back to the front side of the engine we got the camshaft and the idler gear installed being sure to properly line up the timing marks before torquing down that idler gear bolt and obviously we have some good driven assembly lube on that camshaft. Moving back to the back side of the engine, we got the flywheel and the shims and the flex plate installed, being sure that the bolt pattern is aligned correctly as it should be, and having my dad hold the flywheel so that I could torque the flywheel bolts to the proper specification. And with that, we are finally to the point of moving on to the top end of the engine, which required mounting the block on the stand from the back so that we could work on getting the freshly rebuilt cylinder head installed. But first, let's talk about what we actually did to it. There was really no reason to think it would be cracked, but a quick magna flux is always a first step in the process before any machine work, and next dad worked on removing the guides, seized it, starting with cutting the top side flush with the head. A lot of times the guides will drive right out, but these ones said nothing doing. They were extremely tight, but eventually dad did manage to drive all of the old guides out and start installing the new guides, which he starts by hand before moving into the hydraulic press to press them into place to the correct guide height. This head is getting the full works, including new intake and exhaust seats installed. So the seat counterbores are all cut here on the TCM25 before the new seats are driven into place. Each seat gets a few good hits with the hammer, but we always like to give one last blast of air under the seat to make sure nothing is, is under it before driving the seat on home. At this point, we're going to go ahead and resurface the head on the surfacer as it's the last step before moving on to cutting all of the valve seats. Our specifications list a valve recession depth for both the intake and exhaust valves, and in this case our valves have a 35 degree facing. Starting with the intake valves here, I start by cutting my seat to what I think will be somewhat close to the finished depth, at which point we can set a valve on each of the seats and measure the depth, making a note of the measurements, which can then be used in conjunction with the digital spindle depth readout on the Surdy machine to take the seat down to the finished depth. Since I only have a single angle cutter to make a 35 degree seat, we have to come back with a second cutter to narrow up the top side of the seat to our desired width to keep the seat contact area within the outer edge of the valve fit. As always, we vacuum check each valve as we go to make sure that they hold vacuum, following the same exact process on the exhaust valves, just at a bit smaller diameter and to a different depth limit. While it is a bit more work than the nice multi-angle cutting inserts, sometimes you have to make do with the tooling you have on hand. And keep in mind on the vacuum checks here, there is some amount of guide clearance so vacuum will tend to leak down the guide. But doing this day in and day out, you learn what readings are acceptable and this head passed the test. All in all, we did some final cleaning and double checks and the head was ready for the assembly. As always, we install our new valves with a little bit of assembly lube on the valve stem and it's really a pretty simple head to go together. There's some little locators or shims under the springs and the typical retainers and valve keepers to keep the springs in place. Back in the assembly area, we can get the head gasket set in place. And this engine does have two head studs while the rest of the fasteners are bolts. I asked my dad to help me get the head set in place so I didn't damage anything. Might need adjusted. Of course, he had to be smart with me as usual. Now this little head has like 18 head fasteners torque to spec in multiple steps and following a specific recommended torque pattern. It's really kind of complicated for how small it is, but it's what you do. Now we're finally getting the rocker shaft installed, but let's talk about how we resurfaced the rocker arms first. Both the tappet and valve side wear surfaces of the rockers were worn, so before going together, we're gonna resurface them using our Robbins VR10P valve refacing machine. 
If you watch any of my shorts or follow me on Instagram or TikTok, you probably saw this process, but using the provided fixture, the surface can be ground following the curvature of the rocker to take just enough material off to have a true surface again. Obviously there's a point where the wear would be far too excessive to efface in this way, but in this case the bushings in the rocker arms were all still good, and the wear was minimal enough that refacing was a good option to save the customer the added cost of purchasing new rocker arms. Then it's as simple as reassembling the rocker shaft with all of the components in the correct order, and we're left with a nicely refurbished rocker shaft assembly. With the rockers installed, I moved through and set the initial cold lash spec on each of the rocker arms, which is done with an adjustment nut on the tappets themselves. Checking with our feeler gauges, we set them so the proper size feeler gauge slides between the valve tip and the rocker, while the next size feeler gauge will not. We ordered a set of rebuilt injectors from Spencer Diesel in Spencer, Iowa, who have always been really good to us in the past with my dad's own tractors, as well as work for our customers. And no, they don't sponsor us. I just think it's really important to let other businesses know when you appreciate and trust their services. Getting closer to wrap this engine up, the front cover gets a new oil seal, and in addition, we replaced the missing camshaft thrust spring that wasn't present when we tore the engine down. The rivet for the spring was also unavailable, so we settled for a small screw and lock washer that we peened on. We kind of decided last minute to replace some of the hardware that was pretty worn from how, however many rebuilds this engine has had over the years. So while my dad ran to the hardware store, I got the cover set on and started getting some paint on this engine. I only had two cans of spray paint for this, and the first one was definitely the wrong color. Um, but the second one I'm pretty sure was the right color according to the hardware store. With some new bolts in my hands I got this back cover where the tachometer drive goes installed with a new oil seal. Getting kind of our final look here at all the timing gears, we got a healthy amount of assembly lube on the gears and my dad helped me go ahead and get the gaskets in place so that we could install the front cover plate. The cover does have that front oil seal that needs to be concentric to the crank pulley here where it seals, so before tightening down any of the bolts it's important to get that pulley pushed on and make sure that the plate is aligned well. With that, the build is really coming together, getting those last bolts tightened down on the cover and installing the pulley with the crank bolt torqued to the proper specification. There were a few things here and there like the oil and fuel lines that were also installed along the way, but I really hope you guys enjoyed watching this quick overview of the machining and rebuild process of this little Perkins diesel engine. We are Jim's Automotive Machine Shop Incorporated or JMZ Online, and we greatly appreciate all of our subscribers' support. Thanks for watching.